Okay. So we do have a board workshop today. It's going to go from now until hopefully 6 o'clock. It's going to be overview of the 2020 to 2030 district and campus master plan. And that's going to be Dr. Kraft and Mr. Bob Parker. So you can stand behind me like that. Maybe somewhere for you. I give you the floor. Hi, how are you? How are you? Um, you all know the term death by PowerPoint. So I'm sorry, I did my best. But um, there's really um, not very many ways to convey all we want <clears throat> to do. So we'll be using a PowerPoint until something better comes along. Um, and I would encourage you to either ask questions during, write them down, write them down for later. Many of the questions in, that you may have in terms of process or planning or governance or kind of the ins and outs of of just a bureaucracy, um, we'll probably land on. That. Specifics to specific projects, um, we have kind of a last, the, the, the last half an hour, last 45 minutes of this thing. So we'll, we'll try to time it up so we address it all and we'll go from there. Um, hi, Gary. The, uh, so I am going to, oops, I'm sorry. I'll see if I can get this. Going to do my best here, and so if um, if you can open up that example, and then it will show up on mine, or will it just be a yours? Okay. Do you have to? Okay. Do you want to see the sample of the? Mm -hmm. This one. Oh, what you do? Escape. Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought a good way to look at this. You probably have it on your screens, and it's on the big screen behind you. Um, these ad nauseum, if you Google image um, campus master plans, you're going to find exactly this kind of piece. There are th literally, I don't know how many of this popped up. Let me see, does it say at the top up here? Um, maybe not, but you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands of views of campus master plans. If you were to click on any one, it shows you the depth and breadth of what they kind of have going on. Um, they're, they're almost always a, a physical representation of uh, deep planning. The boards are always involved, along with all the shared constituencies in a college, the community in a college, et cetera. So tonight we're not focusing on really the specifics. As you drill into some of these, I'll just drill on one and see what happens here. If you drill on this guy, you can see these are, these are placements. Those Those have no reality for what they would actually be. They're just showing you in here the, the typical kind of placement. As you, as you get into other kinds of campus master plans, it starts to get, I'm just choosing them random here, you know, more specific. This kind of resembles ours a little bit. Even more specific, it starts to show waterways and greenery, et cetera. If you were to really boil down then into a particular building, which is a long way in the future, um, for, for some of our, our conversation tonight, then you would start to see specs on the building, um, you know, per peculiarities about, you know, what it looks like and design, etc. So for tonight, we're really just looking at this. Again, if, if, at, at your leisure, just jot down Google Images Campus Master Plan, and you can, to your heart's content, um, go there, go there and, um, and see any of those. Um, Who's been a through, have you been through a, a master, a facilities master planning? Not a, not a facilities master plan for a college, but some other entity, you know, in San Helena maybe, or, or, or in, in private industry? All right. So, you know, we have, oh, Bob, I hate to, I don't, I don't know if you know how many square feet we have. Do you? I didn't think so. Um, we have a lot. <laughs> C's one for one already. Let's just keep score. Um, yeah, thank um, we, um, Matt would know, and I think, and we have talked about this, but we have a small, um, elongated campus with a lot of square footage, a lot of buildings, stuff ranging all the way from 1930 to 2010 or 11 and 12, right? So um, they're, they're uh, an interesting eclectic mix, if you will. Um, let's see, we did that. So objectives, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a little teacherly tonight for you, but understand and be able, this is you as a board, 
articulate key DCMP terms, starting with DCMP, which is the District and Campus Master Plan. Why do we call it that? Well, because of the peculiarities of Napa Valley, because we have multiple sites, and so it's difficult if as soon as we start talking about campus master plans, people immediately centralize here to the main campus, and, the, and they won't talk about American Canyon, Upper Valley Campus, or Mount Veeder, or the other sites that we might have, right? Um, so that's why we're, we broaden this term. Understand and gain knowledge for key financial policy and leadership decisions. Those are all yours to make um, when it comes to the, the plan. At the end of the day, you have to adopt it, right? Um, and those who follow you in four years, in 16 years, and in 20 years, and 24 years will be living with, hopefully, um, the, the general framework of this thing. They're, they're like you, things will change radically in, in that amount of time, but um, you, I hope that we're gonna be able to give them some kind of a template to deal with that makes sense. That, that's really, create an opportunity tonight for broad board inquiry and discussion I think any question that you have is, you know, fair game. It's time to just chat, see what you feel like, what you're not, and present a timeline for future planning. Um, our best shot at what it could look like in terms of planning cycle. All right. um, what is a district and campus master plan? It's just what I said, a framework for stewarding. I, I looked up stewarding. I have, a, I have a concept of stewarding, and it was exactly what... I thought it would be, which, which is just, you know, intelligently managing over a long period of time these assets, right? And I think the people who came before you did a pretty good job, you know, on, on, on looking at the assets. I mean, so here you are. They could have made some big decisions back when they came up to the board in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, they made some big sweeping <coughs> decisions. And so we are sitting in one of those, those buildings, and what you see generally is some of those building pieces. Um, and, it, and it provides um, information gathered from stakeholders. Stakeholders includes, and we'll go over that, you know, internal, external, and guidance on optimizing. This, for those of you, Jeff, and other people who are, who are kind of in land use at all, there's always a best and highest purpose of land. Um, so if, if we're looking at the, the district assets, we have to filter that through the mission, which is, you know, we're a college, right? So then we have to say, well, the best and highest use is something that then enhances our mission or our vision, right, if that works. I'll get to some of these things. Questions or I'm going to try to flesh through it. Um, three steps. You can read them. Um, it, it is complicated, as, as you know. These steps could take... Um, as little as several years up to decades. So this college has been in the data collection stage for about 12 to 14, maybe 15 years, just collecting data. It did produce a facilities master plan, which is different than a total campus master plan. Could you define that if somebody asks you at a meeting? Mm -hmm. Is that a no? Yeah, I'm not asking, it's not a quiz, but I mean, oh, so a facility, <laughs> yeah, sounds like a quiz. So the facilities master plan really is about the way that it's structured here. It, it derives its essence from the educational master plan, right? The background of what we're going to offer, why we offer it, labor demands, those things. The facilities master plan is really surrounding those key academic and core services. We call it the academic core here. Um, what do you need to build to support the educational master plan? Some of those things are ancillary, and we'll go through those. Some of those things are straight academic. Um, surveys and conversations all over the place, and then formulate and finalize um, ideas and concept. The, our internal stakeholders, along with our external stakeholders, are most nervous about that step. So they want to ensure that there's adequate conversation between the board, between the board and the community, community groups, you have the option, I think, as you're out there to talk with all of all the groups that would make sense to you. And then internally, you know, people commit their lives to working here. Many of them have been here for decades, and, they and they're wanting to stay for decades. Um, and it's personal, right? So, and it's also legislative. 
and compliant and legal. So there are things that you have to take a look at. So a DCMP, by the way, is just a really different bear inside a university and very different inside a community college in California. I won't read all these. You can look through. But I point to a couple things. It is grassroots. It starts at the bottom. You, you, I think a, a template for failure is a board creating in a vacuum, you know, your idea maybe of what you think it should look like and then pushing that down. So we'll work on that. How the concepts and ideas support our mission and values. We don't yet have a vision, and I'll talk about that a little later. The plan will be viable on our current and projected financial landscape. Um, we're blessed right now. I mean, I just pulled a few data pieces from the economic analysis for Napa County and the region. So generally speaking, California is like rocking the socks off of every other state. The Bay Area rocks the socks off of every other area, and Napa County rocks the socks off of the Bay Area. But that's a, that's a bit of, uh, that was all legal stuff. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a tippy thing too, right? I mean, so we know we're gonna hit recession, guaranteed. Um, it's a cyclical piece. For those of us, uh, Rafael, and what was the name? That was, that was the Hispanic? What was that? Yeah, Latino, Latino leadership. And, and I think the, econo the, the article I read today, and I think maybe, who else was there? Somebody else was there. Trust, trustee, yeah, Holly was there, and some, maybe somebody else. Um, the Sonoma State Economics Department prof, and he really just talked about the ups and downs, you know, housing, where it's looking. We're in pretty good shape. We expect no big things to happen in the next four or five years, but it would be wisdom for the board to look through the lens of you know where we are now, what makes sense. Um, you want to be able to finish, operate, and manage projects in the future, and not leave a, a mess for somebody to clean up in in ten years. Um, recommendations: the physicality of d district land use. We're not talking primarily about a curriculum. We're not talking about programmatic pieces. We're, we're talking about the physicality of it. Those things live in these buildings, some of them, but all right. Are you okay? You have any questions on the rest of this? I just don't want to read it to you. It's, I do. I have one yeah. question. Sure. Do we know who's doing the survey up till now? Which, uh, if you'll hold that, we have at least six or seven surveys, mm -hmm. um, two or three of which have been already conducted. Some were conducted back in the day. And so I'll, I'll unpack those a little. If you're talking about, uh, I don't know what survey you mean yet, right? Are you, what are you thinking about particularly? For the, for the master plan, I mean. Oh, no, 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 yeah. no, okay. not yet, no. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about what the necessary pieces would be to that, mm -hmm. okay? Thank you, that's a great question, actually. Um, it's a guide, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, I, I've talked to you about re responding to suggestions from the community. I mean, there are the president's office is open door, and as as Bob's, and now uh, as well, uh, all across the institution, deans, faculty have conversations in the community, right? Why don't you guys do a, you fill in the blank, right? Whatever it might be, and um, so this will help us build a grid, if you will, or a, you know, filter to. Uh, measure those things and I'll, and I'll share with you that that filter that we work on two-year process we'll get more to that in a bit but it's gathering data drafting a plan and then adopting it somewhere down the line um, this is a, a little bit of a research calendar again these are these are not draft documents that you're looking at but these are simply estimates and it's important that you recognize these are estimates and that's why they're there I was going to just put fall and spring, but I think you deserve better than that. So prior plans have been going on at least for the history of the college. So I would say conservatively 50 years. So we have 50 years of plans, right? If you wanted to go and roll the scrolls downstairs, you would see this building prior to its, this iteration, et cetera. Um, you would see things like the, the pond, that we have down here with a boathouse and PE um, classes, and you'd see the dock that was built out there, and you would see the pontoons where people swam, and you would see it all, right? So 
it changes o over, over the years. Um, to, to be real, it's better for us to start August. That's where I put the, what I'm calling the Butterwick study, which is the initial draft. Um, it was sent to you, and it's also, oh, I think I have it here. I'll just show it to you just quickly, but, or if you will. Pressing this escape. On. Oop, oop, oop. Can't even get rid of that. It's over thing. here, this one. Yeah, you, you've, does this look familiar to you? I yeah. have it. Yeah. Was it that, if, was, that was attached, wasn't it? Yeah, it was attached, too. And, you know, I think when, when we had our consultant, this was our first consultant who started to work on this, and um, along back in 1415, a, a land planner and use expert, <clears throat> the, the um, uh, land use expert for, for two big metro areas on the coast in Southern California. And um, his approach was to try to get a conversation going between the board and the constituencies and the community by just kind of framing up the 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 college in terms of its physicality so you know he started with this broad piece like this which is just a snapshot of, of the college most people wouldn't recognize this shot because um, most people who went here it didn't look like this it looked like something that was 20 30 years ago um, we there's a lot of stuff on process and planning the piece that I think that the board really appreciated, and I did, was, we'll get back to some of this stuff, but not tonight on here, was this section. As most city planners would do, and you start to look at our main campus as a complex series of interlocking neighborhoods. Um, that's what he did. And we've kind of designed it that way. We've made some mistakes in planning, I feel, along the way. Um, for example, having a performing arts center at one end, housing a lot of the theater, music, et cetera, and then housing some people in that same, same umbrella, organizational umbrella, at the other end of the campus has created some distance issues for deans and also support staff, right? Um, we've done some things right maybe I don't even know um, you know putting all administration here keeping him out of harm's way maybe is a good thing I don't know um, we've been dispersing our deans um, trying to think through trying to get deans closer to the action if it makes sense right close to your faculty um, close to the to the decisions that are being made so there have been some of those things as well you can see on here and we talked about this in uh, Michael and Raphael and maybe Jennifer I don't know. I've forgotten who was around for this, but I know you guys were. Um, we really addressed those places that don't have a lot on them, right, and started to look at those. The green belt in the middle, in the pond, the, the fields, the, the, other, the other industrial area, or the solar field, the north corner. And then four is kind of this academic um, core, the campus core. Um, the district and campus master plan will address all of these areas again through the lens of, I don't know how long this building's gonna be here or should be used for this site, this. I mean, somebody anticipated it in 2002, they built out this library space that used to be stacks into a boardroom. 20 years from now, it may be a ridiculous use of space. You know, who knows? Um, and I, I, I frankly don't know, all right? But, um, We'll re-examine some of the things that we have done and, and will do. Um, I think that's it. I mean, you know, you can go back to, this document contains a lot of depth at, that really um, digs down to design parameters and trying to find the essence of what Napa Valley's design aesthetic might be, those kinds of things. But that's way down the line for us, right? We're not doing that yet. Okay, so I, I press escape. escape. Yep. And then and just go back, back to, to this guy. Way. Okay, thank you. I'm getting it. Nice. This guy. This guy. All right. And then up, right that uh, way. up here. Um, yeah. Hopefully that doesn't start you all over. No, it it did. That's all right. That's all right. We can just fly through. I'll fly through. Ron? Um, Ron? Yes. Are you going to um, give us the link to this PowerPoint? 
Yes. No, yes. I, actually, I won't give the link. I'll, I'll post the PowerPoint. But we just finished it today as a team. So we'll post it right, right after the, the meeting. Thank you. I have a quick question about the, um, the document you were just looking at. Um, so as I understand it, that was never formally approved by the board. Is that correct? No, there was nothing to approve. Okay. It was just a research document. Okay. So, but elements of it that kind of speak to policy type decisions, where did those come from um, if, if they didn't get approved by the board? It was, so the consultant, what the consultant did was a long, I think they were in um, about seven months on the project or so, maybe a little longer. So downloaded all the relevant policies that existed at the time and the shared governance pieces and try to try to infuse those somehow in, in that document just to make it more relevant. You wouldn't want to bring somebody from the private sector over to a college and pretend like they could then do this kind of work because they'd be falling all over themselves forgetting constituencies or, you know, they have a great idea for a building that's an academic building and you know, it's not going to work, and, and we'll get there. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Maybe you can answer in a different way, or, or question it in a different way. Well, um, well I, I, I was reviewing it, and I, and I made a couple of comments mm -hmm. um, about mm -hmm. things like there was a, a, a phrase, property enterprise ownership. I'm like, first of all, what the heck is that? And secondly, that sounds like a philosophy to me. And so I'm just wondering, something like that that feels like it should be policy-ish? Ah, yes. Where did that come from? How did that end up in this document? That, my guess is that's, that was his term to use in conversation with probably local county, city. You know, it, it may have a, there are enterprise zones, and he might have been reflecting on that I'm, I'm, without me going, but I'll come back to you on that. What I would say, and we're going to talk about this, there are policies that yet need to be established by you that, that are on the books but need to be updated. And there are APs surrounding those that you're gonna to have to update as well in order to allow people in the future to pull this off, to actually do stuff, right? So we'll, and we're reviewing those processes now. And Bob, well, we'll talk a little bit about it tonight, maybe. Um, so this has broad stuff, um, facilities, project list, that was bondy, right? I mean, w when we were doing the run up to the bond, um, what we did was do a facilities master plan, right, which is a broad-based sketch. It's a framework. Um, and then we got specific and drilled down to a project list that said, okay, knowing that we can't do everything in the entire planet for a billion dollars, you know, what do we then do which is necessary? We kept parroting that back um, based on in incoming needs and, and et cetera. And then we, we surveyed the community it was a 50-50 kind of approach. I felt it wasn't a good time to go out for something that we, um, we needed. And, and frankly, there were other pieces that we felt were missing. So with, that were pointed out in that survey, the community survey. Have you guys done a utilization study of what you have? Good idea. I mean, so we're doing that now, and, and we'll talk that through. Um, the housing feasibility study is not necessarily a piece of the DCMP. It's a project that will fit within that. And, I, and I'll unpack that a little bit, because that started back about 14 years ago and has resurfaced at different points. Think of a dolphin swimming through the ocean, coming up for air now and then every 10 years. That's the housing study. Maybe that doesn't work. Um, site and project analysis, we'll go over those things. Um, I don't know. I, I, probably in the last month, I've talked to four people with brand new site ideas you know, for the college. Um, some things are doable, some aren't. Campus and community conversations. I think, it, I think this is an important one. You, you can play a bigger piece here, I think, which is normally you think of the Rotaries or the other groups that you might meet with that are kind of social or big, but I think m meeting with, uh, oh, what is it, Gary? The writers, what it, tell me, what's your group? The writers group? Napa writers? Yeah, Napa Valley Riders, the, the PTAs, the small, the, the, the swim team clubs, those people are really at it, right? And they're, and they're Nappans. And so they really have a very strong opinion of stuff. And the same, you know, with our up and down valley. But so I'm not sure that through casual conversations or presentations at, at Rotary that we really get. It's more like this, right? It feels like I'm just 
blabbing to you, and I'm sorry for that, but um, campus conversations, and then developing a final plan in March through a, about a year from now. I'm hoping that gathering this, this piece, the final plan will come to you about a year from now. Does, it, does that mean, the question is, that we have to wait? No, absolutely not, right? We, we have a going concern. We have stuff to do, um, projects to work on. Um, this document is, is got to be uh, a document that, that understands those projects that we're working on. And, and hopefully I can unpack that for you tonight as well. Questions? You're good? All right. Overarching themes, reactive to proactive physical planning. Um, I think with our, with our big planning, with our tech, tech plan finance, you know, the FMP, the, the, uh, the um, um, facilities master plan, we have moved to a proactive, but this, this is far and beyond where the college has been to really being proactive. So what do we look like in five years? Y you would be hard pressed to answer that, right? I would too. 10 years, it gets even harder, 20 years. But when we're done with this, you should have a pretty good idea, and the community should too, about our template. This is what we intend. And we all agree. It's a living document because stuff happens, right? Um, the fires, earthquakes, our recession, nobody likes wine anymore and it becomes illegal again. I, I have no idea, you know, what might happen, right? But those things, you know, have to, have to be flexible. Nobody anticipated nor saw nor in their wildest dreams thought that the governor and the chancellor would propose a 115th college that's online, no fee, non-accredited, short-term piece, right? Nobody thought that would happen. And when they proposed it, it was with non-certificated teachers and non-labor of any kind. It didn't go over very big, as you can imagine. Um, and so some of those things have happened, but it's still a wild card out there. So they're, they're launching three programs, but my guess is they'll do more, right? Some of their stuff um, will probably eliminate some of our sister colleges' programs. Because everything else being equal, you, you better be, you better know what's going on. So it's a living document. And different projects have different pathways. I put pathways there, you know, for you to kind of understand that the stuff that you see or it's coming to you come from different ways. So um, let me see, I had a couple things, and Bob might help me here, I'm not sure, but uh, let me see, let me get to this real fast. Questions so far, are you good? Have you, I told you it was death by PowerPoint. Oops, I got to go the wrong way. There we are. Um, I just had some examples, so I wanted to make sure that I had them. Oh, yeah, okay. So um, academic and support projects are, are, are our, is our health lab, right? The health building, health oc, um, labs, classrooms, et cetera. Um, let me see if I can grab something else. The culinary kitchen, for example, is an academic and support project, all right? The part of the, of the admissions office redo was, fits this. Um, most of the measure N projects of our last bond fell into this category, all right? Um, we have some, some pieces that are non-core ancillary projects like the bookstore. Um, we have the warehouse. It's ancillary to, to academic and support, right? You could, you could say, I'm talking about student support in the first one, not institutional support, right? So it has no real placeholder in an academic support project. Um, another one that might be the career center or the child development center. Those, those pieces are non-core ancillary kind of pieces. Um, including this room, right? Um, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting mix, right? We have to have it, but community enhancement projects like the Vine Trail, right? It's running through the campus. The Arboretum, which is the green belt. Um, I, you know, maybe a stretch, but I think it's right. Maybe the, there was a leadership and you know, kind of picnic ropes area up at Mount Veter Farm that we're redoing. Um, it's, it's almost a community enhancement. And then there's some blended projects. The LLRC is a blended project. It's a community and academic building. It's a public library. It was built that way as a public library. 
It's also used for academic pursuits and some support pieces. The PAC was never intended for instruction alone. It was, it was built for instruction and then to serve the community's needs. So it's a blended project, right? Um, the role, at least I hope it wasn't built just for that, right? Otherwise, you couldn't fill 459 seats with, you know, our current student population between 10 and 1 p.m. Um, okay, board roll. Board roll. Are you good on this? You want to try some out? Some possibilities? Tennis courts are what? Where do they fit? Oh, come on, nobody's looking. It could be academic. Yeah, I think so, right? As long as we have a tennis team and we're offering tennis classes. How about the pool? Community academic. enhancement. So are we offering aquatic classes right now, Mr. Vice President? Yes, we are. Yes, we are, so it's good. When we don't, right, then it becomes um, something that we have to hold on to. When I came in in 2012, there were, we were at the bottom of the pit. Money was really tight, and there was uh, pr different kinds of proposals. Close it down, drain it. If we drained it, then we'd have to fill it in because it just cra you know, it's the pressure issue, right? So there was a lot of hue and cry, especially from me, right, um, and other community members. And, and then we created a community enhancement project out of there, bundling together a lot of users, you guys remember this, from outside to help us support the upkeep of that thing. Right? Not the enhancement of it, modification or even repair, just keeping it where it is, right? And let's say, how about the Wine Education Center, which is coming up, and we'll talk about that. Where does that roll? Does that sound so academic? Yeah. So the, the Wine Education Center is, is um, it's a philanthropy kind of funded piece, which will probably be blended, though. It'll take some, some district dollars, I would think. Um, it's going to primarily build an academic building, right? Um, and there will be some non-core ancillary projects in there, um, but primarily, I would I would think we would need to look at it as a as an academic support building, right? So they fall. And and my whole point here is the lines are not, you know, perfectly clear on this stuff, right? And the lines get more blurry when you change the modification, which you're sitting in, again, the library stacks, right? Is that what this was, Eric? Do you know? Do you remember? Where we are right now, uh, these were the tables. Tables. So All right. We yeah. So I hope, because I'm an avid reader and I love books, I just like the way they feel, um, that that library s stays that way. But, but um, there are some colleges who have now moved away from stacks completely, and they're just digital stacks. You don't need this kind of room, so you adapt your building to do something else, right? Which is, you know, very sad, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, yeah, for my librarian over there. Um, this is the... Yeah, yeah. Um, roll of the board, these are things that, you know, we have some board policies. I, I'll, I put an attachment in your group of things, which I think we, I think I bolded and underlined those board policies that are in play and left free those the, the board policies that we still need to update or work on, and the APs. There's a lot of APs out here that we really need to work on. So we're in this process. Um, most of those, or all of them, will be done well within the time frame of this kind of planning process. And, and, to, and to Trustee Baker's question, you want to be on solid ground in your decision making to say, is there a, is there a policy that helps, helps support this decision here? Some of them are, are new. I mean, frankly, we, we've talked a little bit about our sister colleges that are addressing housing and ancillary pieces and district auxiliary service pieces. Um, they're having to, to weigh into case law right now, figure out how they should approach these pieces, you know, what, what's, the, what's the natural steps? Um, because the, the, the private colleges and universities have a different schema and set of laws. Um, public universities have a whole different group of things, and then, and then you have California community colleges that, that roll into their own. So we're working through these. Um, I, I, is there any, you want to comment on any of these, Bob, or do you guys have any questions on, on just policy, board policies? I don't know if there is anything. I don't mean to put you on the spot particularly, but, you know. Okay, that will be a no. Okay, so um, thank you. That's two, two for two, Bob's rolling. Um, nobody's keeping score though, Bob, that's good. 
<laughs> the uh, contract approvals, what we've done so far is that housing feasibility study, right? Um, and we had put the housing feasibility study out to Scion Group, and Bob could touch on that a little bit, you know, I think. Uh, so at the December board meeting, you awarded the contract to the Scion Group. They'll actually be on site next week. Um, and so that uh, housing feasibility study is moving forward. Space utilization study, we have an RFP on the street right now. It closes next Thursday. And so we'll be coming back to you probably at the March board meeting with a contract proposal for the spatial utilization study. Question about that. I just want to confirm. I feel like I've heard the words audit in, in regard to the space use utilization. Is, is that the same thing? Um, that's a little more forensic, but m maybe. I mean, I mean, you could certainly look at it that way, um, that it is, it's, looking at how we're utilizing all of our spaces on campus to determine if we are putting those uh, spaces to the highest and best use. Yeah. I, I, I would say that as a board, and certainly me as president, I wouldn't go into our constituencies and we're doing, we're here today, check out your stuff for an audit to make sure it's the highest and best use. Well, people are gonna freak out with that kind of language. So we're really looking at utilization, time, place, manner kind of a thing, you know, the um, Bob's brought it up before. It's really a good one. And the, the community room is booked a lot over here, sometimes for 10 people, you know, so maybe that's not a, a good thing. Um, you know, we have classes. When I taught at Southwestern, I was in room 222. Yes, link it to the TV show um, for, I don't know, 18 years. It was mine. Don't touch my stuff. I left Southwestern College went up to be a president in Washington, was a president in California, went back to visit some friends. My stuff was still on the bulletin board. It was, it was like, yes, it's, my, it's mine, right? So you run into some of that kind of stuff. I took it down just as, you know, because it was embarrassing, right? But, but that's the deal. People develop attachments. So the, so the utilization study is not without some trepidation. And so we're trying to make sure that it's very very well understood. I think people, though, now at the college are in a, an, they recognize the sea change, right? The community is changing, the college is changing, we have opportunities to, um, to do better in terms of our outreach to the community and utilize them in a, in a better way. And we'll talk about some of that as well. Can I, um, can I yeah, ask a question? Um, is the space utilization study just for the main campus or is it for every, every campus that MVC is on? It, it is for every campus. So if you, in the uh, request for proposals, we specifically mention the Upper Valley campus and the American Canyon campus. And then I keep hearing Mount Beter. Is that is that on the list, even though I hear there's nothing on there, but that's also going to be looked it at? It is. It, it's one of those things. I guess you could, Mount Beter's in no worse condition right. than the pond and the boathouse here on on the main campus. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear, the, the space utilization study and the firms that will be contracting with are specifically looking at physical at spaces buildings and, at buildings. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then, yeah, we'll come back to the Mount Vitor piece, I think, a little later, but yeah. Um, and the last piece is on the real, you've done a really good job. I thought that when we started with the ad hoc, you know, the real property subcommittee, it was a really good piece and it was a way in which to try to vet some of these ideas. And as it got more real, um, I think y you made a good decision and created, you know, into a regular subcommittee, not ad hoc anymore. Um, and that subcommittee now is very similar to the audit and finance subcommittee meeting to do the heavy lifting, if you will. Doesn't mean that you're not gonna be in the mix, just like you aren't with the other subcommittees, but, the, but, but a four hour presentation on drilling into some of these things is this is not, not the venue. The best we could do was this, actually, was trying to put together an hour and a half thing for you. So you're gonna rely, I hope, on your subcommittee, their recommendation, and then doing a lot of homework and study and debate and whatever it is that you need to do in, in the future. Um, constituent um, group feedback and the community stakeholder input, and then you kind of work to the draft, draft plan. And then the final plan, as it comes to you, 
um, you're going to get questions like, you know, what is this? What is this building over here, right? Where it says, you know, future educational building, right? Well, that's exactly what it is. We've identified most likely that that will be an educational, um, like our first category, uh, you know, as we grow. Or it, it could be something that's just not earmarked, right? Future growth or whatever we might do. The more specific you can get, I think, to provide guidance to the folks that will follow you, the better. Because you're going to leave them in the same place you are, which is, you know, what are we doing here, right? Um, okay. Um, this, is, this is campus constituents. This is where it differs now from every other institution bureaucracy anywhere. Yeah, um, um, the council presidents, which is, everybody knows council presidents, right? This is our Senate folks who sit here. Um, generally, these, this is the Council of Presidents. There's some labor that sit at this table as well, and they're not included, but the, but the four Senate presidents sit here. That's part of our shared governance um, process. Their role is guidance and communication, reaching out to their constituents for input. Often that is in the form of written stuff. How do you feel about this? Get back to me by email. They collect those things, get back to us. A lot of policy kind of is directed that way. They recommend to, um, to me and to the cabinet and to other committees, and they're, um, they're a recommending body. Right? President and cabinet, they do research, budgeting, coordination, consultation. That group is technical experts, subject matter experts, CPAs, attorneys on, on um, my staff by dotted line. Um, general contractors, consultants, survey takers, experts, right? So that's really what the president's office is supposed to do. You have to have that consolidated some places. At some of the big institutions, you'll have an office, not to be confused with our office of planning, you know, research here locally. You'll have an office of, of planning and strate or strategic planning, something that sounds like that. Usually they're staffed just by the people I said, and at about a million a year payroll, and you know, we can't do that. Um, District Facilities Committee is drawn from a broad group. Bob um, has, I think, probably a better idea of that one, yeah. So they're representatives of uh, the Academic Senate, the Classified Senate, um, uh, ASNVC, and so it's a, a representation from all of the constituent groups on, uh, on campus, and that's the group that um, initially worked on the facilities master plan, reaching out to uh, the rest of the of the community and so, uh, campus community for input, and so that's also the group that reviews our facilities policies um, before they go through the uh, constituent groups and through the uh, policy approval process. Exactly, I, th I think it, it helps our constituents feel that they're represented, that they have a voice, and. And, uh, you know, our culture here is to work through committee as much as we can. Um, we have a, bl a planning and budget committee. Um, the budget committee would be eyeing a, a particular project for, its, for its, its financial implication, right? Um, we're going to build, hmm? we're doing infrastructure on, on technology, or we're going to remodel a classroom, or, you know, how much? You know, where does this come from? Do we have funds, right? Um, can we, how do we work this? I'm, I'm intentionally staying away from some of the higher profile projects yet because what I'm trying to do is, in, is, is let you know that all of, all of the entirety of what we've got going on here is part of the DCMP. Um, the projects that are the highest, and we'll talk about those projects in a, in a while, that, that are kind of on the burner, um, are of greater interest maybe, or, you know, to people, but housing being one, but housing is working its way through this process. It doesn't have to. I'm doing it because I'm honoring the, the kind of our culture of participatory um, decision making or shared governance. It's really not a shared governance issue. Um, it, your right to do whatever, your right as a board to do whatever you want to do with a, with a category kind of four non-academic piece on a piece of land that's not used is nobody's call, but 
don't we want to use the process here so we can get all these subject matter experts weighing in? Um, and then Academic Senate on relevant aspects. Um, actually, Eric stepped away. Hate to call attention to that, but he stepped away. Um, on uh, and relevant aspects subject to uh, 10 plus 1. And there are, so uh, for example, on the Wine Education Center, it's funded through a capital campaign through our, our um, external um, foundation. They're doing a really good job, and we've shared that with you. Um, you know, they've got over $3 million in pledges. They're working on their next $2 million right now. Um, it's coming along very nicely. And we haven't even done the soft opening yet. So we really haven't done the pitch. Um, and I th so I think we'll get there. When I met with them, it was like, here's what we'd like to do. And it was like, nice, but you need to talk to my faculty who would be living in this space and planning this space. And so we couldn't just build, I don't think we actually could, build a building that would serve as a curricular headquarters for a program without weighing in at least some way with the Academic Senate to get their curricular interest. Could we fight it? I don't know. You have a different feel on that, Bob, or good? There's probably a nuance. I might be, I'm, see, here's, my, here's my, my role, is to make sure that we move things through the college and the community in a way that makes sense. So this could be a blurry line on pieces, but um, why wouldn't I make this stop? Why wouldn't I involve faculty to see what they want as subject matter experts, right? We're, we're in a smaller community, and it's important. I mean, you know, this piece. And why wouldn't I go with the outside community, which we did? We met with vintners. What would you like? What do you want to see? We're going to be teaching the right things here. Right. Is there a point where we open it up to like public forums or community yeah. workshops? And yes, yeah. I mean, some of it's very appropriate. So if if you're, and we talked about this, and when we're talking about housing, I think you definitely need the public voice, the community voice. Um, if you're talking about the, you know, if, if the wine train proposal, we'll talk a little bit about that, becomes a reality. There's some public voice that you have to talk about. Same for American Canyon. If, if the college wants to expand its operations down there, then you'd want, you'd want to hear the public voice, right? Up Valley, the same. We're in deep conversations with um, St. Helena City Council, the county in and around and up, up through there, um, the city manager, all those folks, just listening to what they would like us to do. Okay. Um, these are the four sites we've talked about. I think you're good. Uh, you may not, what you probably should get in your head is in the middle piece, the Mount Veter sites. There's two pieces up there. We talk a lot about the Mount Veter farm, but the Dale Peters Clyde Preserve is a 40 acre site that's, that's adjacent to the Mount Veter farm by a little, Michael's been up there. I think it's a little, so, yeah, yeah, it's like a little, a little widow piece that kind of marries them together, uh, you know, and then there's a, a neighbor in between. Um, but the, the preserve was used, again, it's like so many pieces, it was used 20, 30 years ago as a prime site for biological studies, for botany, for nature stuff for our students. So they loaded them up in the old yellow school bus, went up there, and they spent the day in credit um, explorations of. And so fully, it's fully usable for that. We, we wouldn't be able to, wouldn't want to dis disturb, but the, the Trails that are there are still there, um, not as nice as they used to be. And you can see the little signs here and there if you go up there and go through that process. Um, so it's, it's pretty good. OK. Um, this is the main campus piece that we did. The, OK, so how do we, let's move to projects. We're almost, we're getting finished with this portion, right? But I wanted to, I was thinking about you the other day, you know, as a group. And I sat as a board member for 12 years. So I was like, what would I, how would you guys, I'm you asking me, how do you make decisions? What factors do you use, you know, for projects? So these are just out of my head and Bob's head and with some cabinet input as well. And hopefully maybe we've missed something here, but institutional operational pieces, so you can see them. They have, they, they got to be in the vision mission. Coherence means that it's not, we're not building something that's so far afield that it makes no sense uh, within our academic core. So, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that would, 
I don't know. I don't know what I would be doing. I'm, I think a dry cleaners in the middle of our campus would be odd. Maybe that's a great idea as an ancillary core service. I have no idea. Um, but it's got, it's got to meet that real test for you. We have no vision statement. The college is working right now on a vision statement to help you and me and all the community figure it out where it is that we want to go. That will, I think, strongly influence, I hope, the nature of the d district and campus master plan, whatever, whatever that turns out to be. Right? And, you, and this is no mystery. Just think of any great university that you, that you would pop to mind, the Big Ten, the Ivy Leagues, the, the Fighting Irish, Cal Berkeley, who else? <laughs> SMU. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, you know, they have mascots, they have trademarks, they have logos. Most of them have a vision, right? And then some of them get, get sloganed, like uh, what, what, Harvard on the Hill is used for several community colleges in the state. People just do that, right? So it's got a little snooty, you know, overlay, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then there are others that are, you know, purely specializing in some area. We need something that allows the community to weigh in and gives us direction. Um, it's got to be practical. Smart goals, right? You all know those, right? Um, a, a really multi-year, 10-year project, I'm not sure it would make the cut here, right? Um, that's not a, you know, in a bond campaign when you're, when you're getting money and you're working towards a plan, but a single project, if, if we were pitched and said, you know, this is a 10-year developmental project, I'm not sure it meets, meets the cut. It better be dang good on every other thing, right? Coherence with the DCMP, right? That's why we're doing this. It should make sense. These are future projects after you guys adopt this. I'd like to do X. I spoke with um, PUC and Sonoma State, and I met with a chancellor at um, UC Davis. And they all are really interested in opening or uh, running cohorts here for BAs. Just means a classroom where a cohort of our students who are ready to go on would attend those colleges here. Well, that's a that's a nice plan. There are colleges, you know, and community colleges that have built edu educational corridors, they call them, or pathways or complexes, where they house six or seven privates, publics all together. You can do chiropractic along with the Sonoma State, you know, wine education. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it's got to fit somehow, right? Um, financially prudent, risk versus return. Cultural impact, we have a lot of that here, right? Um, institutional innovation, community service, stakeholder, legal. There's a million things, and, and as we know, the case law changes all the time. Um, operational factors, which are different, governance input, your input, leadership staffing capacity, capacity of the projects or initiatives to be understood. I've had people pitch me these great big amusement park things, right? <laughs> And they're so big that I can't even wrap my arms around all the phases. Where would you start with this thing? Well, we'd start with a roller coaster, and then we could build in two years this and that. It's such a big thing that it gets incomprehensible, um, and, and it's difficult. Um, OK, these are areas of immediate board. This is the last slide in this section, right? But we wanted to talk about, as you remember, this, this came about. Dr. Um, Kraft, yes. now, before, now that you've switched slides, I have one on the uh, question on the uh, previous slide. Yeah. You talked about the, um, uh, the other parts of the, the college here working on the vision and mission mm -hmm. statement uh, for what they want the, the college to be or, or what they want to see in the future. What's the board's role in that? It's a, it's a great question. Bob actually... Um, help me kind of clarify this. You know, we were thinking about your role exactly in this, and he said, you know, the board is really another, cons besides being a board and you get the final call, right, you're also a constituent group, right? So if you were to look at a circle with visioning, then we have all these other, other folks we normally go to, you are in that circle. So it should come here. You should have a conversation about the vision of the college yourself, just like the rest of the college is doing. We have a presentation that we can present to you, the same kind of pieces. 
You can go through the process that we kind of did in a retreat. Um, we, you could, you should fully be in there because at the end of the day, um, it, the vision statement is going to come through the planning and um, budget committee as a recommendation for the board, and that train wreck would be two years of processing and then the board fine tuning that on the fly you know in an hour so we don't want to we don't want to do that so you'll have lots of opportunity and all and i guess that was kind of my concern yeah that yeah. if the college is coming up with a vision and mission statement and just saying here's our vision and mission right. statement and the board hasn't had any input into that right. we could end up with potentially on, on you know the worst case that completely opposite views right of what the college should yeah. be in the future and you have uh, yeah that's it's perfect we have an bless you we have an existing mission statement so that's under that's supposed to go under review next year for re-examination the vision statement will help inform that mission i i think and um we'll see where we go so i'll we'll construct an information item it's not long i mean it, you know at least to give you information like it's like a 10 or 15 minute presentation um great Great, great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so these are the things that you talked about last time that you wanted to see on a future agenda item. And we kind of put them all together under this facilities piece, but the DCMP. Um, maintenance plan, utilization study, we've talked about a little bit. I think American Canyon site is on there, you know, specifically because Trustee Goff has brought it up and said, you know, let's focus. I'd like to learn more about it. So um, we'll talk. The wine train proposal, we can talk about a little bit. Proposal is not the quite right word yet. It isn't yet a proposal, but they're getting very close to it. And we can, we'll talk about that. Wine education center, campus beautification, which includes, you know, like maintenance of the the physicality of the campus and the learning environment, if you will. And then there are other pieces here. We, we, Amber came in and addressed security. I'm not sure, Michael, that you got out exactly what you were trying to, to nail, you know, but we could, that's what this is for. So we have um, another, what, 35 minutes or so to kind of just unpack these, talk about these things. I would say, thinking about the slide that we used for for criteria, um, I think they work. And the reason you have is for you to think about those things and the community to think about those things, add stuff, you know, detract from them, you know. Um, they should meet these, the Wine Education Center, the Wine Train proposal, if it's, if it's going to actually get here. Um, there's been some issues in, uh, from different sporting um, groups who would like to do some field enhancements, at least three groups that I know about. There are, there are resort pitches, um, you name it, all, all kinds. Some that you know about, some that I don't, um, but let's just talk about them. Maintenance plan first, right? Maybe Bob, and you can just relax there and do it for Okay, that. yeah. I'll just relax here. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so the, uh, as part of our planning and budget process, we have set dollars aside, and you know that we set dollars aside in this year's budget, and we'll be setting them aside in next year's budget as well for both the uh, maintenance of our, uh, doing scheduled maintenance on our facilities as well as our technology refresh plan. And so for both of those things, the technology committee has been working on the outline of which computers and which uh, classroom technology units will be replaced in which years so that we can, number one, come up with the proper uh, number to place in the budget, but also so that that message goes out to the campus community. You know, we've been doing a good job of addressing items as they come up, but what we need to do a better job of is planning for um, items before they come up. And so that's what we're doing in technology with the technology refresh plan. And in addition, we had a conversation, Matt Christensen, our director of facilities, um, spoke to the planning and budget group uh, last week, at, at our last meeting, I should say, in uh, January, about the scheduled maintenance plan. And so how often do classrooms get painted? How often do offices get painted? When do floor coverings, vinyl floor coverings, get replaced as opposed to carpet? And determining where 
different spaces on campus were in that um, in that um, uh, scheduled maintenance cycle, so that people would know. You know, it often comes up when people are putting together their unit plans um, for their particular areas. Do I need to ask that room 1635 gets painted? Well, you shouldn't have to ask. You should be able to go to the scheduled maintenance plan and see that. And so that's what we're developing. And I think, Catherine, you attached a document um, as part of this, uh, this item that talks about gathering that data and putting that uh, putting that together and that's what we're in the process of doing right now that also includes so we're talking about physical spaces in in terms of classrooms but that also includes the fields and maintenance of our of our uh, facilities our our sports facilities on campus we've been certainly behind the curve um, in uh, the past few years because of a uh, lack of appropriate staffing in our groundskeeping. We have recently added a groundskeeper, we're adding another groundskeeper, and so we'll be able to concentrate um, uh, more fully on, again, not just addressing issues as they come up, but really um, um, uh, uh, doing fully maintaining the facilities on an ongoing ongoing basis. Um, uh, so I think that covers the, uh, the maintenance plan that we're, um, that we're developing, the various maintenance plans that we're developing. Question? Yeah. Um, when you develop a maintenance plan, does that include staffing as well? That, you know, if, you, if here's what you think you're gonna need, do, do you incorporate how much staff you'll need and then work with HR and budget and all the other pieces? Or is it kind of, this is our plan, somebody else needs to figure out? No, so that that is part of it. And it so is. if we are, we are currently um, working on getting fully staffed right. in our facilities right. department. And so we hired for the first time in three years right. a maintenance mechanic who focuses on painting. Okay. It's, uh, you may see that some spaces on campus have been painted that woefully needed painting. Well, you know, we have the, the staffing to do that. And so if we are fully staffed in facilities, we believe that we have adequate staff to address um, what's happening on campus. To improve that, we'd be looking at, as, as we develop our unit plan for facilities, we're looking at um, uh, the need to increase facility staff in those so areas. Do you feel like you, you now have a, have a maintenance plan that's really proactive and, and complete? Do you feel I, pretty good about it? I think we're getting there. I don't, okay. think, I don't, I don't think we're fully there yet, but okay. we are certainly have taken a step in the right direction. And by the end of this semester, I believe we'll be there. Great. Okay. Thank you. And you know, I would say you know, emergent things, something's going to leak, right? Monday, I, you know, I guarantee it, right? Somewhere. And we'll probably have to address it. And so our mechanic slash painter will become a, you know, roof. a roof repair guy, um, you know. And they do, yeah. I mean. Yeah. So regarding the maintenance plan, so we know that the fields flood. So how does that get addressed in the maintenance planning process? Like, do we try to prevent that from happening down the road? And how does that factor in? Well, so long-term planning. The, the flooding of the fields is a, is a bigger issue. And so uh, what, what we're looking at, a maintenance plan, the maintenance plan is making sure that we are maintaining what we have. Uh, the flooding of the fields would require some major infrastructure changes. And so that's kind of outside of a maintenance plan, but that would be part of and was part of the uh, overall facilities master plan. I have a kind of a follow-up question to that because it, it, in looking at that previous document um, that was shared, the campus village idea I think was they were looking at the fields area, and I was like, whoa, that's that's an area that's prone to flooding, and and we've had discussions about that before with the river and everything like that. Is 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 that issue going to be addressed in a in in the campus master plan? Like, what do we do if? Or do we try to mitigate that right now? You know, what, what, how does that factor in? We both probably have answers, so yeah, go, go. Oh. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say this, in, in terms of the, 
The river doesn't flood this way. <clears throat> the, what we get is the flood from the rain and the creek runoff this way, so the ponds and those things. And then the, the field is a bit lower. So basically we have a lower a lower t um, uh, topography, and then we have a large berm that runs up to railroad tracks, which is well above any level, and then back on the other side. So I think, Jennifer, the, the key here is you know, drainage, different kinds. We have to bring those up. Basically, Gasser Foundation, the theater, all of the all of Napa Sport, all those sit on exactly the same template, and they and they are I think 3.75 feet up. I think that's what they shared. I, I, you know, it just sticks with me. Um, we'd have to raise them, do some infrastructure on that. I mean, it's a, it's a major undertaking if if and when. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of those projects. So Windrain is proposing some of that down there. So. Maybe you can unpack it a little more. Yeah. More? Yeah. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the um, the long-term solution to the flooding of the ball fields requires some significant investment in uh, in um, raising the, uh, in particular, raising the the level of the fields. If you, it's it's not on this particularly, but we've been talking about P3s and we've talked about that and unpacked some of those things, right? I think some people think that P3 is a private entity, you know, combining with a public entity, you know, but it's all kinds of, there are probably hundreds of those pieces, right? So we're doing a P3 feasibility with the city, which is trying to build and improve Kennedy Park fields, which would alleviate, so if we I'd rather spend and work with a shared field, and we've talked about this in the past. If the city is willing to move forward, then necessarily convert one of our fields next to their fields. And just, you know, those are the kinds of things that you kind of plan, um, kind of if-thens. And that's why the DCMP is a little bit flexible, right? So provided down line the field's gonna be improved, it appears in your plan, but you've got a P3 with the city who's saying, you know, why don't we go together and build two fields that are wonderful? Then you don't have to pull the trigger on that, and then we would probably look at that property for the next best choice that you had, which was probably, I don't know what that would be, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's a field anyway, but, okay, sorry. Um, utilization study, do we need to know more about that? Be good on that. What's the outcome, what's the, what's the document gonna, look like do we know Bob we've talked a little bit about this but the, yeah so what will be of course we haven't uh, we yeah. haven't accepted a proposal yet so um, what the um, individual study will will look like still you know remains to be seen but our goal or our expectation is that um, the outside firm will come in look at all of our spaces uh, at all of our locations um, look at how they're currently being used, the times of day that they're being used, the capacities of those spaces, and come back with suggestions um, for us as to how we could better utilize the assets that we already have um, and to give us a template that we can use to do that assessment ourselves on an ongoing basis. And so as I say, that... Um, RFP closes next Thursday, and so we'll be reviewing those uh, proposals at that time. And as I say, that does include all of our spaces, Upper Valley Campus and American Canyon. And in terms of the American Canyon site, it's, it's on here specifically because we have made some specific upgrades, primarily in the technology area, upgrading the um, classroom technology, and probably more importantly, upgrading the, um, uh, the uh, internet and Wi-Fi access uh, in, that serves those classrooms. That um, Wi-Fi and internet access is our responsibility. It's not something that, for those particular classrooms, it's not something that comes from um, um, Napa Valley Unified School District. And so we are, uh, we have been working with Comcast to increase the internet speeds and increase the accessibility in those, in those classrooms. Back to the utilization study is, um I find that fascinating, honestly, because it just seems like there'd be so many different variables um, that I, I wonder what, 
is it going to have like a this is this document is going to be good for the next say three years and then they're going to give us a template that we can use to continue similar surveys on our own but you know i'm thinking like are they going to be able to look at a space and say okay well if you were doing this it you would want to use it for this but if you were going to go this direction i'm just wondering how how is that going to be informed well, so certainly that's our expectation is that they are going to look at uh, our spaces with with um, in a way that we wouldn't necessarily look at them. They don't have the history that we have that we have. They don't have the um, the uh, preconceived notions about how spaces should be used. Um, that's not to say that we expect any wild proposals to come out of the utilization study, but the idea that have you considered um, doing this to address this issue? You know, you've got this building over here. If you reconfigured a couple of classrooms in this building, that would give you the space that you need to do this particular function. And the functions that are currently taking place in this building would be better served by moving somewhere else on campus. Um, it's a pretty big undertaking. These firms have, have done many of these. And so, and so the expectation would be that, yes, they're doing it today. Things may change three years from now, five years from now. Give us the tools that we can use to do this again as uh, things change in the future. Good. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. uh, the result of, of the RF, uh, um, we will, they will come to us in March or... April so we're, or... the, our expectation would be that we'll bring the proposal for your approval. The, the, we will bring the contract that, that we're recommending we award to the March uh, board meeting, and then that work would start very soon after that. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and my guess is this would it's going to fall, I would assume, below the bid limit. So this will probably just be a consent item. As, as, a, as a contract, and we will have vetted out these companies. You know, staff would have done that. Yeah. Um, let's talk about um, a little bit. We still have uh, 15 minutes left or so. Um, so just quickly on the wine train, the, um, this started, and we don't want to talk about it too specifically because there's not a specific proposal yet, but, um, and I'll catch us up to, to track here real fast. In 15, the wine train um, met with me and maybe Bob, and maybe not, no, um, and unpacked um, their desire to explore the college as an option for relocating their, their culinary pieces and maybe some of the other stuff because they were thinking at the time of relocating some of their downtown Napa pieces. Um, it iterated from there. The more that they knew, learned about the college and then learned about our programs, oh, didn't know you had a culinary program, you know. Um, oh, didn't know you, you know, you had a welding program. We could use welder. It iterated into one of those categories that we talked about before on this slide, which is a blended approach. So it, it is anticipated, I, I think, in our last conversation, that they would like to explore how they could um, build buildings that serve both academic student support and in adjacent buildings that solely serve their purposes on the same site. Um, and it, we're waiting for a couple things. I think, I don't know, Kyle, if you want to weigh in or I can just keep going. I, I'm only doing this because we went to dinner with the principals the other night. I mean, does anyone have questions directly on it? I mean, it's... I think it's right there, right? Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Does it align with our current educational master plan? I mean, it, can you see connections that? Absolutely, especially, I mean, when they, commissary is the word that comes up in my mind, but with welding and culinary, those are specifically aligned with our okay. programs. Okay, and, and so are you talking about a mutually beneficial agreement or, yeah? We can unpack, I can unpack a little more of the next steps. So we went, it, they, they've met with the subcommittee, Michael was chair, are you chair this time, Michael, I think? I'm not sure. Whoever is. Um, Raphael, maybe, or somebody, or Jeff. I have no idea. I'm trying to keep up with these things. Um, they met with a subcommittee a couple times. I think he came in to the subcommittee and presented. 
Um, and they've been kind of sharpening their own stuff. So they, they made, I'll, I'll point now to this picture up here. They were looking at, as we recall, this area up here, right, at first. But the trouble with that area, as we described, was that the tracks are too, you can't get enough angle on the tracks to come down to service stuff. So they started looking down here um, in, in what is our present um, solar field. And, you know, I, you know, at first I was like, okay, tell me what you're thinking, you know, and it's like, well, what if, a lot of what ifs, what if we improved that site, raised the solar field up, did parking lots underneath the solar field, so you're kind of net neutral there on what you got going, and then we built our facility maintenance shop, we built a uh, welding and machine tool piece, which is a, a a good address of one of the project pieces. We built a culinary piece that would serve both training for local businesses and industry, but also might provide a home for us, et cetera. So the last iteration is then, you know, we met with the principals. Um, They're an LLC between Noble House LLC and a 50% ownership of local Napa um, folks. And my comment to them was, you know, this is, you know, even though it has stuff on it, right? I mean, so I'm not really worried about disturbing the issue, but it has really no infrastructure, and it has no, I mean, there's no sewer and, and major electrical and stuff running down there, right? It's below grade, et cetera. I'm, and the college is in no position to want to do a feasibility study for you to see whether or not that it works. Um, so their thought process at least in our last meeting, goes, well, if we did a feasibility study on our dime to at a go no go to see whether or not it's even a buildable spot, would you object? And that answer is not really. We're not signing any any go no go. Um, I, I'm not, not sure what that might look like, but it's it's allowing somebody. I would do the same for somebody looking at the pool who wanted to upgrade the pool for some reason. So it's, it's a no harm, no foul, no inside deal, no done deal, no, these are the kind of conversations I have, you know, with, with our constituencies, you know. Um, the, our own faculty are pushing very hard to try to make this work because it, it benefits our career and technical program so heavily. So they see benefits in this, you know. So the next step, I think what we proposed was for the wine train to meet with the subcommittee, talk about their desire to have the subcommittee recommend to you all to enter into a, uh, I don't know the term, Gary, you have to forgive me. Um, you know, I'm going to use a term that's not right. But, you know, looking at a feasibility, is it buildable? And is it, is, are there so many pieces here that make it just impossible? It's a $50 million infrastructure, so we're out. You know, or whether or not it makes sense for them. Um, so that's the kind of the next step. It, it's a win-win for the college because we'd figure out whether or not this is this is indeed a buildable area, whether it was with them or somebody else. As as we've told you before in maintenance, the solar field is aged. The technology is so old now, ten years, um, that it is not even replaceable. Um, so. Um, my guess is that, you know, in, in the conversations that Bob's had with other, with other solar companies, um, and you might bring them up to speed just real quickly on that. Sure. So we've, we're approached quite often from uh, people who provide solar panels and, and uh, solar structures, and we've been working with a group that is associated with the California Community College system. Um, to look at shade structures for our parking lots as an alternative to the um, uh, uh, use of the solar field. You know, as the solar field, we've, we've had some system failures, equipment failures in the solar field, and as uh, Dr. Kraft said, it is aging the technology. What What's available today is uh, much more effective than what we have in the solar field, and so we could, if there is a better use for where the solar field is located right now, there are other options for us that would be in many ways more desirable in terms of uh, generating solar power for the campus. Are the critters that are usually over there 
the sheep and stuff, are they ours or are those like rent a sheep? They're rent a sheep, okay. yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> I, I had another question as well. Um, number sure. one, I think our students would love to have the solar field covering the parking spaces. Um, but you mentioned the CTE component. I'm wondering, has uh, the County Office of Ed weighed in on this as, as being interested in, in being a part of that? Or we're not, I know... Yeah, we're not that far yet in terms of... Okay. We've always... Um, we thought about our housing project as a P3, right, which was no right. dollars expended unless it's a no-go. It'll be, a, it'll be some consulting dollars, and that would be it. But, um, and we're looking at this. At first, we started, it's all on their dime, right? Rich right. company, they come in. Right. But the reality is there are, there are grants for just this kind of, of right. participation. There are, um, I think, there's philanthropy that's also available. I mean, I, in th this could be funded up in, a, in probably a stream of different income that, that would make sense. Okay. Um, but I, w I was talking about the, the programs themselves. The programs themselves. Yeah, you were talking about um, <clears throat> when the wine train comes in, you can, you can match up uh, MVC's culinary with the wine train. Would you also work with the county programs? Because I know the county office of Ed oh, does that. Um, I'm not sure. We're not there yet. You're not there yeah, yet? Yeah, you know, early. maybe. Okay. I mean, uh, the, the natural thing here is if this became a center right. for culinary tourism hospitality training. Right because we'd have the facility then and the wherewithal, the bigger draw, then my guess is that more high school students would dual enroll to right. come on over here and do stuff, and do stuff. I, okay. I would think. And we could, right. all, and there's some great culinary programs in the system already out there. Yes, there are. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to keep us going here because we're, we're close. So I would expect the, the – I'm not sure we have a subcommittee meeting set yet, you guys, but we can probably set that tonight and Rob can you know, set it up. And um, and I suggested that the, we ha um, Kyle and I had a meeting with a community member on that, and I suggested that that you also meet with that with him to kind of uh, identify a day that might work for both of you. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Wine Education Center is a privately funded piece um, that, and I've shared a little bit about it. Um, it's moving along real good. This it's been soft open. The the hard Opening of the capital campaign will happen in the next two months or so, um, probably at Duckhorn Estate. Um, I think it's a who's who of vintners will be invited to that, and their goal is to raise um, millions that, that evening in pledges and, and then begin. And then we'll have to, then we'll have to get to specific design and specific um, uh, dollar flows and how we would build that building. Theirs is a unique piece in that they would be building on our campus, not leasing any piece, and then donating that building to the campus as, as, a, as a part of their piece. And that would probably happen before they, they build it. Um, and most of these others are just simply long-term land leases. The wine train will land lease, of, I think, at probably a 50-year or something like that. Um, the housing, 30 years. Um, and those, all those things revert to the college at, at that point in time, or are open for renegotiation. So you should have, I'm gonna wrap it up here, right? For the DCMP, you should be able to describe it generally for yourselves and the different you know, plans, and, and know that at least there's a matrix of ideas that we're, we're meeting with. I'm, I'm meeting with some guys coming in or people coming in on the sports fields in the next little bit, new people. Um, a hotel group wants to see me. Um, one of the things that took a hit in the Butterwick original document, the one that we opened up and shared from 15, was he laid out, like any, any land planner, potential, potential uses of stuff. And I think the faculty had not been around a campus master plan, so when it said you could do this or this or this or this, they landed on whatever it is they didn't like and said, you know, you can't do that. And it's like, well, no. It's not. It's just called out as a potential, um, and what we want to do in this iteration of the DCMP is start to winnow those things down so you have a real definitive piece. Um, finally, I would say you are one lucky board. Honest. I mean, having that picture in front of you in this community with the ability to shape a legacy oh. campus is an amazing um, it's an amazing opportunity for you. 
and 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 I also um, I weigh for you on your accountability and responsibility to your constituencies. So they really are going to bend your ear on what what should be and what should not be. And I think that's really good. So this is the first of many healthy kind of conversations, and I appreciate us being able to walk through this time. One minute over, dang. Yeah. It'd be the chair if you if you want. I if, have if one quick question. Um, the um, are you anticipating since this previous report that went that was created back in 2015? Are we looking at creating something similar that would be the outcome of this whole project? And and would you be looking at having a consultant help with that as well? Or is absolutely yeah. The, the group that we'd have are designers, architects, consultants, attorneys. There's a whole group of people who would help us do that. Landscape architects, um, and so there would be a physical PDF kind of document. And then a more very much an interactive, if you go to those campus master plans and go to any one of those colleges and universities, some are phenomenal. I mean, they just take you deep, 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 and um, they give, a, give you a real vision of it. Uh, up to chair if you want to recognize a speaker. I just want to address the board. Does everyone feel comfortable with it at this point? Can I take 10 seconds, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I know the time is short, and I want to get out of here myself. I do have to get out. Um, I addressed you in November about making sure what you do is data-driven, that you have an excellent excellent department in the CTE. Um, I'm afraid that the tail is wagging the dog. I agree 100% with Trustee Rios. This has to be a reiterative approach. You have to be informed and go back and forth instead of seeing something delivered to you. Um, and I'm very, very concerned, not only with this, this institution, but all the institutions in this country, that government functions are being privatized. I think it's an ideological battle, and I don't like it. I've received a wonderful public education, and I don't want to see this privatized. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. All right. So that's the end of the workshop. I'm not sure.